Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Angela Nardozzi, and I'm a guest and settler on Turtle Island with both sides of my family originating in Italy. Um, today, I'm on the traditional territory of the Mississauga of the Credit River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, um, also known as Toronto. I'm one half of the Gikanua Madawin webinar series, uh, which I co produced with Dr. John Paul Rastoul, uh, who's a member of the Doki's First Nation and also the Chair of Indigenous Education at the University of Victoria. Unfortunately, he can't be with us tonight, um, but we are still very excited about this, the second installment in our partnership with the Robertson Program for our series on Indigenous Ways of Knowing in Math and Science. The Gikanu and Madawin webinar series is all about, you know, assisting teachers, encouraging teachers to bring Indigenous ways of knowing into their teaching. Um, and tonight we've got excellent guests who are going to uh, bring us down that road. So. I'm going to invite now Larissa Lamb to come and talk a little bit about um, the Robertson program and the partnership. Thanks, Angela. Um, I'm Larissa, as Angela said, and I'm the director of the Robertson program for inquiry-based teaching in math and science. And we engage teachers in inquiry-based math and science through uh, professional development. Uh, we've worked with teachers uh, across Ontario, mainly in spatial reasoning and geometry. And we also uh, more currently have been working directly with children in playful ways to increase math skills. Um, if you wanna learn more about us, we have a website, uh, therobertsonprogram.com. You can feel free to visit it. But for tonight, we are thrilled to be partnering with Angela on, and John Paul on this webinar series, um, because throughout our work with teachers, a, a common question we hear very often is how to incorporate Indigenous ways of knowing in the math and science classroom. So it's so nice to have so many of you uh, with us today. And we are very excited to have Marlo and Nancy as our guest speakers. Um, Marlo is a member of Red Rock Indian Band, and after teaching Ojibwe in the provincial school system, she began teaching in Arrowland First Nation at Johnny Terrio School. And this is when uh, we, the Robertson Program, first met Marlo and we started working together uh, to learn more about uh, incorporating Indigenous ways of knowing in math. We've had a chance to visit our school, just absolutely lovely. I could really go on and on. Um, currently, she is the special education resource teacher and the Choose Life coordinator at Johnny Terrio School. And in addition to all of that, uh, Marlo is pursuing a master's of education with a focus on land-based education. Her research focuses on incorporating authentic land-based teachings that support student identity and Ojibwe language revitalization within the classroom and school setting. So welcome, Marlo. Nancy, uh, our, our other guest, is also a member of Red Rock Indian Band and has been working in education for the past 26 years. She has taught children for, for, from First Nations in North Western Ontario and the provincial school system from elementary all the way to high school. Currently, Nancy is the education coordinator for the Anishinaabek education system. And in addition, she is also pursuing her master's of education with a land-based focus. Nancy is committed to supporting uh, the education for Anishinaabek youth by recognizing the importance of language, culture, and identity. I don't know where you get the time to do all of that, plus a webinar, but we are so happy to have you, Marlo and Nancy. To, uh, just a quick note to our audience, um, Marlo and Nancy have invited questions throughout their presentation, so please post them in the YouTube chat and we, uh, Angela, will try to get them uh, to the presenters um, and as many, as, the, um, as many questions over to them as, as possible. There is also going to be a time at the end for questions, so please keep those questions coming throughout. Okay, Marlo and Nancy, over to you. All right, good evening, everybody. We want to thank the Robertson Program, uh, Inquiry-Based Teaching in Mathematics and Science, in particular, Larissa Lamb, for reaching out and asking us to provide this presentation. 
We would also like to thank the team that is associated with this evening's presentation, Dr. Jean-Paul Restoul and Dr. Angela Nordorzi, and of course, the technical team of Zach and Callum that have supported this behind the scenes. We would also like to acknowledge each of you uh, that have taken the time to join us tonight. We welcome elders, knowledge keepers, fellow educators, family members from many places across Turtle Island. Nancy and I are presenting in different territories tonight, and therefore I want to pay respect to the area that I am in. Currently, I'm in the territory of Treaty 9 in Nikina, Ontario, which is approximately four hours northeast of Thunder Bay. As a visitor to this territory, I have an immense amount of respect and gratitude for all of the people I have been fortunate enough to form relationships with. For that, I say, Apchi Miigwech. Miigwech, Marlo, and uh, thank you for that awesome introduction. Uh, so I would like to introduce myself, Oni Bojo, Niji Anishinaabe, Nancy O'Donnell, Indigenous Cause, Opogana Singh, and Donjaba, Ginin Bangi, and Donjebwim, Gitchen Nimmin Wendom, Nogom, Anishinaabe Kwe, and Dao. I am a teacher and I have been working in education for 27 years. I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie. I am currently living in Nipigan, Ontario, uh, where my mother's family is from. They have lived there for generations and continue to live in respectful relationship with the land. <clears throat> I am a lifelong learner, and so I come to you today uh, with humility. I am uh, continually learning um, and growing, and I'm very grateful to elders and knowledge keepers who have shared uh, with me about language and culture and the history of Anishinaabe people. I also want to uh, let people know that Marlo and I are cousins, and so uh, we are connected uh, through Marie Rubina McDonald, who is my grandmother and Marlo's great grandmother. And so I am very thankful to be here. Miigwech for the invite. Bojo, Marlo Gokash Nandishnakas, Zakate Ekwe, Monglo Dem, Nikina Nandojiba. School, Aroland First Nation. So what I said to all of you is, hello, my name is Marlo Bokash. My spiritual name is Akpegwe, which means the first light that rises in the East Woman. I am from the Loon Clan and currently am the special education resource teacher and choose life coordinator at Johnny Terrio School in Aroland First Nation. On a very personal level, I am a member of the Red Rock Indian Band that is situated on Lake Helen First Nation. My connection to this community is through my father's mother, my grandmother, March. This connection or this community is situated along the shores of the Nipigon River system in the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. I must also mention that I am of Métis ancestry through my mother. I also recognize with respect my Irish and Ukrainian family history. I passionately have embraced my spiritual connection to my Ojibwe language and traditional teachings from elders and knowledge keepers relating to the land and ceremony. As a continued learner, I will pass on knowledge and experiences that have been given to me. These teachings are true to me and how each of you learn from them is for you to connect to. We each are on our own learning journey, and I cannot sit here tonight and tell you, you must do this or that you must do that. That would not be respecting the sacredness of the teachings. With that, I say that I am honored to share my journey and the journey of my students in mathematics and science while on the land. Miigwech. Okay, so Marlo and I wanted to start our presentation. Uh, so before we begin sharing about the learning experiences with everybody today, uh, we really wanted to tie the learning into the spirituality. And so when we are talking about learning from land, um, there is a spiritual connection that is there. 
And uh, for us, when we are engaging in that learning, we will begin our day either with ceremony, um, laying tobacco, wh whatever the protocol is with the communities that we are working with. And just to really emphasize that learning from a kith, and a kith means land in Anishinaabemowin, is that there is a connection to generations of knowledge in that learning. Um, there is connection to community and there is connection to all beings. And so that respectful relationship is integral to the experiences that we're going to share with you today. Um, we do treat the earth uh, with sacredness uh, with all of our relations and all of our relatives on the earth. Um, so just em really emphasizing the importance of that, um, you know, that um, that respectful relationship with land is uh, what grounds us in all of the learning that we do. <clears throat> so I just want to uh, share a quote with you from uh, Dr. Cormier and Dr. Ray, uh, who are also Red Rock Indian Band members. Um, and this is from one of their papers. <clears throat> and they, they shared, the land, our mother, is more than a resource. It is our identity and our culture, end quote. Miigwech. We feel that students do not always need to have a piece of paper or a pencil or a notebook or recording, recording device in their hands when they are on the land. Naturally, our people needed good, keen listening and observation skills in order to learn and carry on what their parents, elders, and knowledge, teacher, knowledge keepers were teaching them. Therefore, we will purposely leave all writing materials back in the classroom. This makes for a spiritual connection on a very holistic approach to each student's learning. Marie Batiste states, as Aboriginal peoples of this land, we have the knowledge to enable us to survive and flourish in our own homeland. Our stories of ancient times tell us how. Our languages provide us with these instructions, end quote. Okay, thanks, Marlo. So uh, when Marlo and I uh, began talking about what we were going to be sharing, uh, we did want to highlight um, that we weren't going to um, highlight specific curriculum expectations. So recognizing that there are participants from across Turtle Island today, uh, we didn't want it to be uh, centered on Ontario, which is where we are. Uh, so we aren't going to tie into um, curriculum expectations. We recognize that um, naming expectations also does not validate the knowledge, um, that that knowledge is, is validated in, in who we are as Anishinaabe people. And so, uh, recognizing that uh, participants will take away what they need to, um, to apply it to curriculum expectations in, in whatever role they have at this time. Okay, Marlo. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, we begin all of our teachings as soon as junior kindergarten. And so tobacco bags are presented to students on the first day of junior kindergarten. These medicine pouches are with them each time they leave the school to be on the land. The teachings of the medicines, along with the significance of making the sacred offering back to Mother Earth, is given to the students so that they can carry forward their own knowledge and respect to the land and all its offerings. The medicine pouch travels with the student through their entire time in the school. When they leave to move on to grade nine, or if they leave our community to move on to another, their medicine bag carries on with them. Okay, uh, Marlo and all, we also wanted to highlight the importance of elders and knowledge keepers in all of this learning. Uh, again, emphasizing that uh, generations of knowledge are being shared with us as educa educators and with the students that we are working with. Uh, we recognize that uh, that respectful relationship occurs when we invite elders and knowledge keepers into community. Um, or in some cases into provincial schools. And just being respectful of, of what is being shared with us, um, recognizing that, um, you know, for myself and, and probably for Marlo as well, um, 19 years in an education system. And I will say that it took to my master's of education where I actually heard um, indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing being shared. And so that's a long time. <laughs> that's a long time to wait. And so, 
um, you know, as we move forward as educators and, um, you know, if we're working with teacher candidates, which is a role that Marlo and I are engaging in, um, really, uh, you know, moving us together um, because we recognize that all of us, um, Marie Batiste talks about that, all of us have been um, marinated in Eurocentrism. And so how do we move away from that and, and incorporate this knowledge in a respectful way? And so I, I, do want to I do want to share that, um, you know, Batiste talks about um, that us as Anishinaabe people or Indigenous people have come to realize that we don't have to be um, recognized or legitimized by Western worldview, um, that, that that is part of who we are. And so as we recognize, however, that we need to be in schools, we need to be in textbooks, and we need to be in curriculum. And so through that, we will have a transformation of knowledge. And so that's what brings Marlo and I here today. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're going to share some awesome learning experiences with you. I just wanted to speak a little bit to this picture. This is three generations of family. Uh, teaching gill net setting in, in order to tap the net under the ice takes a mathematical concept of area and perimeter. Um, the depth of the ice versus the length of the net drilled in the hole is a learned process. And if you do not understand how far the net has to stretch out, uh, the entire process will not work. I do believe we have a question. Yes, hi, it's Angela speaking. Uh, there's just a question from the audience and maybe it, it, we need a little bit of clarification. Um, the question's around how does it work to teach such a strong spiritual component in um, what might be considered a non-spiritual public school system, but perhaps you can clarify a little bit about what that looks like and how your school is connected to your community. So I'll speak first and then Nancy, if you want to talk to that. So I teach in a First Nation school. We are not um, a Catholic school. We are a, a federally funded First Nation school. So when I speak about spirituality, um, I am making a connection to uh, our teachings. I'm making a connection to the ceremonies that we have uh, in our Indigenous knowledge, whether that may, may be laying down tobacco. That's a spiritual connection to the land. Um, you know, we also have sweat lodge, we have powwow, we have um, pipe carrying, we have uh, spring ceremonies, we have feasting. Those are all spiritual connections in our indigenous ways of knowing and teaching. So um, I, when I say spirituality, I'm not meaning to sit in a, a a, a, a Catholic church or a or of any uh, religion by any means spirituality for us is connecting emotionally physically mentally and um, spiritually mentally physically and emotionally thank you sorry I had a little bit of a block there Nancy <laughs> right I, I think it's a really good question and I'm glad that that somebody brought it up because you know, it raises, to me, it makes me think of um, when I hear terms like outdoor education or even, even using land-based education, what does that mean to educators? And so what does that mean to us as Anishinaabe people? If, if I'm inviting in elders and knowledge keepers and we are beginning that day in a good way and grounded in ceremony, that is a spirituality. Now, having come from a provincial school system, there has been this land-based or um, you know, I, I don't like to use the word land base, but there has been learning that has happened with a kit or with the land. And I think that it's um, something that you have to bring up right at the front, you know, so where uh, parents are aware um, that um, there is, you know, there might be smudging or the day may open with ceremony. And so letting parents and students know that. Um, but, but you are hitting on a very key difference between um, outdoor education and learning from a kith. Because when we learn from a kith, it is, there is a spiritual component to that. So thank you for that question. Nancy and I had uh, a lot of discussion, you know, how did we want to lead into these uh, activities that we're about to share? 
And so we thought that math and science through uh, reciprocity with the land, what are we giving and what are we getting back? So we are about to take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, again, please ask, we, we, we would love that. All right, here we go. So the first activity that um, I wanted to share with you is uh, science and math related. And so it's the tapping of the birch trees. Um, many other places will tap maple trees right now. I know the sugar bush, bush is very popular down in, in the south, but we do not really, we don't have any maple trees in our area of Long Lac. So we tap, um, or Hanikina, or Long Lac, or Geraldton. So we tap birch trees. And so the understanding of seasons must also be uh, present in this activity. Indigenous teachings of the birch are extremely integral. The birch gives itself to the people in order to travel, cook, collect, and heal. The teachings are extremely important to have elders and knowledge keepers share. So in this activity, the students were able to um, measure the circumference of the tree. We collected the sap and they were able to understand how many liters we were uh, taking from the tree. Uh, the sustainability of the forest, we have uh, a lot of deforestation that's happening and I speak to that in a couple other slides. And then of course, stewardship of the land. If you've ever had an opportunity to uh, do this activity, then you have very sore hands. And um, the science behind tamarack decoy making is one that you must have patience. Hunting in the spring plays a very vital role in many, if not all, Indigenous communities. The collection of the tamarack branches become the helper for the hunters. Formed into small duck decoys, as you can see uh, right here, um, are then placed on the water's edge. They attract the ducks migrating back to the local area. The collecting of the branches provide a true sense of community and family as they begin to hunt and in essence provide food for their families. So we go out in the springtime, we start to collect the branches, we bring them back and we form them into long um, uh, bunches. And a lot of the time the children want to form their bunches very, very quickly. So they want to collect the largest uh, pieces of tamarack that they possibly can. However, as you can see at the top of the tamarack uh, decoy, you have to bend the branches. So the thinner the branches, the better and the easier for them to be uh, wrapped with the sinew. Um, the, the, the children love this activity. When you soak the tamarack decoy in warm water, the smell that comes from that is almost that spiritual connection back to the land of the activity that they were able to do. So this all ties into science and the migration of birds and our patterns. Again, another science activity that we did was building structures. Um, and so in building structures, students are introduced to the traditional housing that was used during hunting and following the migration of animals. This type of lesson can then further develop the sense of understanding of the sweat lodge, which is used in ceremony. The introduction of ceremony at an early age builds an understanding and connection to the individual identity of each student. And I see there is a question, so I'm going to ask. Dr. Nardozzi? Yeah, we've had a few questions and I'll, I'll stick with one right now that I think is most sort of on, on, you know, to this slide and then we'll we'll come to the other ones maybe a little bit later in the webinar, everyone. Um, you know, one person wanted to know, do, what do you use the birch sap for? Do you use it for anything? Um, so Nancy, would you like to do medicinal teachings of the birch? Uh, well, you can go ahead, Marlo. So I'll, I'll let you give the reference of uh, Johnny Terrio's school for that, just respecting that, that photograph that you're sharing. All right. So uh, we boil this down. We drink it as a tea. It uh, does help us in, uh, especially women, during our moon time. It also allows us to have, um, it allows us to cleanse our system as well. 
Um, Any time that you boil down and you make a tea, it should be drank in moderation. So we're not telling you to uh, take all of the the sap and, um, you know, drink a whole vat of it or anything like that. So, you, you know, that, that is one of my teachings that I have been given. Did you want to speak to that, Nance? Uh, I'll wait till I get to my slides because I will talk about another okay. use of birch. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the little girl that you saw in the slide prior to this is the same girl. So she was in grade two in the first slide and here she is in grade six. And so you can see the connection to trees for Monica. Um, so we were studying uh, the boreal forest and the spiritual connection to trees. We looked at the deciduous and coniferous trees in our local area and the medicinal use of each. Um, so we know that from our cedar, our cedar tree, uh, I'll just give you one teaching. Our cedar tree gives us, um, if you have a really bad cold, you can boil that down. It clears uh, chest infections. You can have that steaming in your house. You do have to be very careful with cedar and to not, you, you just use the green branches. You should not use the part that the sap is on. Nancy's gonna speak about the cedar in a little bit as well, but the sap can cause um, a lot of harm. Pregnant women should never, ever, ever drink cedar tea. So that is the teaching that has been passed on to me as well. Um, through this science uh, unit, we really went into deforestation. Uh, in our area, mining is becoming, uh, if you know about the ring of fire, that is where, this is where it is going to happen. And so we talk about um, the ring of fire and the good that can come from that and the bad that may come from that as well. As we get economic development, where our animals are losing their habitats and how do we reforest, you know, how, we talk about reforestation and that stewardship to the land and the collaboration with local forest companies, um, we need to really, really start planting those seedlings again. As I mentioned earlier, we really start very young with our students. So uh, we talk a lot about animal adaptations and so this entire activity fall allowed the students to learn about when and how animals migrate, hibernate and adapt to our winter. The significance of the seasons in relation to the 13 moons that we as Indigenous people follow and the medicine wheel became an integral part of this entire unit of study. And so uh, students were out on the land um, making bird feeders observing the, the ajitamo, which is the squirrels in their natural habitat, what they were doing throughout uh, a, quite a while. We have winter for a very, very long time. So this really allowed them to get out onto the land. There is another question. I love the pictures of the young kids in the snowshoes. Sorry, that's not a question, that's a comment, I love it. Um, the question uh, was around, do you use the language as part of your lessons as you're doing this? Yes, absolutely, we do. We have a um, we have two resident elders in our school, Miss Pauline Gagno and Miss Nora at Lucan, and so they are fluent speakers. And when we are out on the land, they are with us. And so our students are learning their language from JK all the way up. So we really make those connections to, um, you know the the season the bon they're learning the tig gong um gone you know every single word that when we're out on the land we're talking the language to the kids great question miigwech this young boy is um setting a martin trap and taking what we have trapped uh, back to the knowledge that he had started to learn in grade three. And here he is in grade eight. So he learned to be an observer, a listener, 
and now he is able to demonstrate his, has his skill as a provider. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the deforestation is uh, becoming so rampant in our area that we are starting to see a depletion of marten um, and other animals that are, are uh, very common in these areas. And so the students really get to have uh, a true connection to just how integral all of our area is and where their feet are planted and what is happening. The next slide that I'm going to show you um, may, I, I'm just going to say the next few slides that I show you um, really get into some, um, some people may take offense to it, but we really are trappers. We have a trap line in our school. So you are going to see animals that are no longer walking. Um, you are going to see animals with hide taken off of them. You are going to see animals um, hanging. Okay, so I just want to give you that heads up. This was a science uh, unit that we looked at beaver habitats. The children were out on the land observing the, um, the movement of the beaver. Uh, the children put a camera down into the beaver house and they watched the beaver swim around. They watched where the beaver was collecting its food and, its, and uh, where it was storing. They then learned how to set the beaver trap, which is extremely dangerous. And uh, you really do need to have your elders and knowledge keepers there with you. The children then learned how to skin and you'll see up in the top picture that is the beaver with the eye taken off. Um, we know traditionally that the hide of the beaver really brought a lot of money to uh, Indigenous uh, people so they learned a lot about trade. And then of course we then used the beaver for bait and I will explain where that happens in uh, a picture that's coming up. So as you can see, the children um, really made a connection with that beaver right from the beginning until it gave itself up for us for our learning. So this was, uh, this is my special education class and we were studying uh, weight and measurement. So we, before we went out to look at the animals, we really had a, a huge conversation about our connection to our clan. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a member of the Loon Clan. And we go into that teaching about clans because there are people that when they are next to an animal that has given its life for, our, for us, they become um, almost nauseous. They can become lethargic because that is their clan that is no longer here with us. If you've ever participated in making bear grease, um, the elder I speak about, Miss Pauline Gagno, has to sit. She cannot even go into the room because the bear is being boiled down and um, is being prepared for medicine. And she cannot be in there because she is a part of that clan. Um, so in this, the children were able to uh, study rabbit and they were able to study marten, beaver, weasel and wolf. And so our land base worker, we have two full time land, ba land base workers in our school. And one of them, Darren Matasawagan, uh, the wolves are very, very bad around our area and they're really becoming quite dangerous. And so Darren had to go out and trap these wolves. He got four in one night. And um, this is a female wolf, but we wanted the children to be able to see the size of these animals. And for them to, you can see in their faces that they are actually making connection to that animal. They are showing that animal respect. There was never any um, throwing around of the animals or making fun of the animals. They were really making that connection. So these are our two land-based workers and we were weighing the animals for grams and kilograms. They were recording the weight um, and if you notice here, this was the first time that I'd ever seen a weasel. I thought weasels were so much bigger, but that is a little weasel. And when you see the measurement, the, the Darren has his um, tape measure. Traditionally, when they would send these skins to the Trappers Association, 
you would measure the, the weasel from the tip of the nose just to where the tail starts. But we wanted to see how long each one of these animals were. And we're still continuing this activity because now we're going from the smallest to the largest and the heaviest to the lightest. And this has really been quite a connection for um, these students. We then went from that to the local species of fish. And we talked about the migrating pattern of our fish. We've had a really slow start to our pickerel starting to cut or walleye, as some of you know it, um, coming into our area. For whatever reason, normally we were able to set that net and do our fishing and, and be able to get a substantial amount of fish um, quite early in March. But only just this past weekend have we found that um, the fish are plentiful now. So you know, we really have that discussion, what's happening in our waters, what's causing our fish to be late. Um, so we weighed the fish and then again, we took uh, a measurement of the length of the fish. So we had whitefish, we had northern pike, we had pickerel, as I said, walleye for uh, many of you. We had perch, trout and a ling. And I am petrified of snakes. And so when that ling came out, it curls itself like that but I have to stop that because um, my, uh, a teacher Isaac Murdoch tells us that we have great connection as Anishinaabe people and I really need to try to connect to that but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. This is the partnership that I wanted to talk to you about and where we had our grade three four class doing their beaver um, habitat that beaver provided bait for this next project. So this was a partnership with Lakehead University and we were studying um, the migration patterns of wolverines. And if you know anything about wolverines, they're very vicious animals. Um, they say that they are the animal that can take down anything in the forest. So what ended up happening was we set up, um, the grade seven and eight students went out with the land-based workers and the team from Lakehead University. And I have to apologize because I forget the researcher's name. So I, I do apologize to that doctor. Um, and what they did was they set up these apparatuses. And if you can notice, if you see my little marker, there are, they almost are like little barb wires. And so we placed the beaver as bait and the wolverine would run through this apparatus to be able to get to the bait. But what it, the, the barbs are doing is it's taking the fur of the wolverine from it. And then they are taking samples of the, the fur from the wolverine DNA samples and tracking that migration pattern. Was that wolverine maybe over in Fort Francis? And did it make its way all the way up into the north over to where Nikina is? And so the kids were able to watch um, on the webcams what was happening with these wolverines and when they were appearing. And some of them are extremely smart and they did not even go through the, um, the scraper, if you wanted to call it that. They would find their way to get up and grab that, um, that beaver and eat the entire, um, and just leave a carcass. It was, it was pretty fantastic to observe and the kids just loved it. I'm now going to turn this over to my cousin and she's going to share some fabulous activities. Miigwech, Marlo. All right, so I am going to share with you. So I have permission from the Shawanda family. They own a company called Great Lakes, Great Lakes Cultural Camps. And uh, this learning is situated in provincial schools. So Marlo, um, what a gift to be able to teach an Aralam First Nation, you know, just the accessibility to the outdoors. Um, so the perspective that I'm going to share with you is provincial school system. And so we wanted to bring this learning to the students about a traditional um, hide tanning. And so we reached out to Great Lakes Cultural Camps and they titled it Tanning Hides in the Schoolyard. Who would have thought, right? We could tan hides in the schoolyard, but we did. And they did an amazing job. <laughs> uh, so what you see on the screen is just some of the, the six steps of the process that we went through, uh, which was skinning, fleshing and dehairing the hide, stretching it, uh, brain solution soak, working, drying it, and then uh, smoking it. All right, so Marla, we'll go to the next. Uh, I'll highlight a little bit more of what's happening in these stages. 
All right, so um, you can see, uh, so the, um, when they have the, the piece of wood out there, that's called nakmachigan, which is the frame. And so they use this frame a couple of times in the process. Uh, so you can see um, in the first picture, they're stretching the hide. And so the students do that uh, with tying string to the uh, nakmachigan. And then there's a, another process where they're drying the hide. And so we did this in February. It was minus 30 out. And so in order for the drying to happen, we needed to do it indoors. And so um, part of what they're doing is they're um, pulling, when they pull down on the high, uh, some of the water comes out. Um, another part of the process is taking the hide and soaking it into the, um, the brain of the deer, uh, mix it with some sunlight bar soap, hot water, and so you mix it by hand. That helps with the softening of the hide uh, before you're getting ready to uh, tan it, to turn it that beautiful color. Um, I do want to emphasize here that the Shawanda family um, did begin the day in a respectful way. Um, students were in that space. Um, there were some protocols that they had to follow. So for example, there were times when they could not have their cell phones out and they could not take pictures. Um, that is um, so that we were, were respect, respecting the protocol that the Shawandas um, offered to us in that learning space. Okay, uh, you can go to the next uh, slide, Marlo. I also want to emphasize that if you um, look at the pictures and there's a little video that there were generations of learners in there. So we had elementary school, we had high school, we had elders from the community come in, we had um, um, parents, we had education staff. And over this four days, there was continual sort of visiting, people coming in, people leaving, uh, people learning together. So in every uh, part that we did, there was language involved. So if, if um, we were talking about the process and there's the Nishinaabemwin words that go with that, that was shared with the students. Um, emphasizing the teachings that the Shawandas brought is that this is about survivance. So this process is something that generations of Anishinaabe people have done and continue to do. Um, so it is, you know, it is still happening. Um, the picture where you see the students with all of their hands out. Uh, so what they are doing here is they have a spruce. Um, they called it like a punky spruce and they were breaking it apart and they are taking that and it's part of uh, tanning the hide, um, you know, at, at a later stage. So in this room, we had science, we had like grade nine, grade 10, grade 11 science students coming in. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at that and as a science teacher, I'm thinking, oh, they're increasing the surface area, right? They're breaking apart the spruce, they're increasing surface area, they're going to increase the rate of reaction. Now, did, did I or did I hear any of the uh, facilitators, um, the mentors, the teachers say that? No, I didn't. But just because we didn't name it doesn't mean that the students didn't learn about surface area and rates of reaction, right? And so I'm going to touch a little bit about that on, on one of my later slides. Okay, so Marlo, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so sitting down with the teachers after we sat and talked about what did they see? So what they saw was cross-curricular learning. They saw generations of knowledge, generations of learners, um, indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, so talking about respectful, relevant, reciprocal. Um, there was community benefit. So we worked for four days and we got two small pieces of hide. Um, nobody got to take those home. Like it, it wasn't, we weren't doing it for one person. So the success of that lesson comes from the communal effort. Right. So so as a community, this was the product that we created. And and that makes me think of, um, you know, that education in a Western view can be seen as very individualistic. You know, what are your grades? What success do you get? This is not the learning that I saw um, in this situation. It was um, it was a community effort. And, and so the success was ours together as a community. And so to me, that was really honoring an Indigenous way of knowing. Okay, uh, so Marlo, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so in the next slide, um, 
just remembering that that this worldview. Um, so nobody in that room was the expert. There was like if you were to walk in, you wouldn't have been able to tell who was facilitating. You wouldn't. Uh, kids were participating. You know, elders. It it was there was no expert in that room, and so it made me think of an article that I read. Um, this was research that was done in the James Bay Cree area. And what the researchers did was they went into the community and they watched the Cree woman and they watched how they passed on skills to children. And so when I read this article, you know, it really struck me that um, the way that our communities have passed on knowledge are is very different than what we see in, in classrooms. Okay, so there's, you know, how in classrooms we have grades. So all the grade fives are, you know, coming in and doing an activity. Well, when, when you're in that, the Cree community, that isn't what happened. And this is not what happened when the Shawandas came in. There were all different grades in there. And also the kids were able to watch. So the students watched and when they were ready, they attempted the learning. And then they helped as other kids came in, they were like, hey, I know how to do this. And then they showed them. They were able to experiment. And then when they felt confident with the skill, then they tried it themselves. And towards the end of the four days, there were, there were some students who were like, they could do all the steps. And so at that point, they would be considered, you know, um, on the same level as the mentor. They, they've acquired these skills. So to me, that really stuck out because it honored an Indigenous worldview and honored those ways of, of teaching and learning. And, and the other teachers that were in that space also felt that. Okay, so Marla, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is just a quick video clip. Awesome. When you were lacing the hive, Miigwech, Marlo. So what I wanted to sort of emphasize there, if you look around the room, you can see different stations, right? You can see students engaging. You can also hear the language being shared. And I could hear students going, good job. Like, you know, they're really encouraging each other, which was so beautiful to witness. You know, we could have, the adults could have stepped out of that room and those students would have just continued with their day. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the second one that I want to share, I know that we're getting close to our, our time being up, is um, also have permission. Uh, so this is from Joe Petawanaquit from Creators Garden. Uh, so if you have never heard of Joe, um, look him up on Facebook. Um, he is an amazing teacher. So Joe's knowledge comes from, he's from Wukwemkwong, and uh, he um, shares knowledge from his grandmother's. And so he was invited into our school uh, to get educators and kids out on the land and learning from plants. So in the middle picture that you see there, we made scrolls of different types of bark. And so the barks that are in there are alder, which is dopuyash, tamarack, which is mishkiwatigons, red willow or bebs willow is zizik famish, and birch, which is Wigwaswatik. And so we harvested and we made these um, birch bark scrolls. And we, Joe was so generous, he gave them out to all the participants. And uh, what he said is you can use this as a bath or you can use it on your face. And so he was laughing at some of us women that were there. And he said, do you know, like when you go and buy those serums, like with the retinol and different things he goes and you're paying like 110 dollars he's like just go out in the bush he said like the properties that are in those barks will do exactly what you're paying for and so um 
Okay, true story. I have a friend who started using that and she used them for about like was washing her face with it. And about six months later, I saw her and I said, what, what has happened to you? Like, you look so young. And she said, I've been using those those scrolls that Joe shared with us. Okay. And that is a true story. And I am telling you, um, I, I don't want to share her name, but uh, she would, she would be a testament to that teaching. And so uh, on the right hand side, we have uh, students. So those students were, that was their job. They were learning from Joe, um, how to properly harvest. Okay, next slide, please, Marlo. I do want to touch a little bit on the science because um, <clears throat> for like about 17 years, I was a biology teacher. So this is where my heart is as well. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the screen, uh, one of the teachings that Joe tells us is that the plants uh, will mimic or will tell you what they're good for. So cedar, if you were to harvest cedar, um, it will help with your um, draining your sinuses, if you have a cold, um, if you're congested, it helps with that. So if you look at the cedar branch, you can see that it mimics the lymphatic vessels in our bodies. So that cedar branch is telling you it is good for helping uh, to make your lymphatic system healthy. And so that's the beauty of listening uh, from Joe is that he will bring that Indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge together. And so for those of you who are, you know, diehard scientists, you, you know, it's just so fascinating to listen to him talk. <clears throat> I do want to share some of his um, respect protocols. So you learn the name of the plant, you introduce yourself to the plant, um, you learn all you can about the plant, where, what does it look like in the winter, in the summer, what animals are around it, um, you harvest respectfully, you only take what you need. Um, and the benefits of harvesting are not only for you, but there's reciprocity. The plants want you to harvest them, okay? And that's really important. And he talked about, um, when we were talking about those scrolls, the alder tree, um, he said that alder, like they sort of grow in a, a whole area. Um, he said that they're nitrogen fixers. So they, that's their role, right? Is they're doing nitrogen fixation in the soil. And so when you stress out by going to harvest and you stress out those trees, then that causes them to do more of what they're good at. So they're going to put more nitrogen into the soil. So that's that reciprocity that he is talking about. It's like we harvest in a respectful way and we help the health of the ecosystem, you know, to flourish. Okay, next slide, please, Marlo. Okay, so in this slide, um, this was just um, a student's reflection and I just wanted to share that Anishinaabemwin is the integral to the learning. We know that the only way that we are going to save languages is to teach languages. And so whenever we can, uh, we're using the Anishinaabemwin words for the trees that we're working with. And so this was from a student reflection and just really appreciating that the student put, you know, the English and the Anishinaabemwin word um, in their reflection. Okay, and the next slide, Marlo. <clears throat> the next slide is also part of the student reflection. And when I looked at the student reflection, something really stood out to me. So I highlighted some of the things and, and the student was talking about, you know, introducing, introduce yourself to the plant. What is the plant's name? And as I was reading that as a science teacher, I was like, hey, that's binomial nomenclature. We can talk about genus and species. We can talk about dichotomous keys, okay? And then I keep reading, and then the student talks about how important it is to get to know the plant, um, talking about harvesting respectfully. So that made me think about, well, the impact on, on plant diversity. If we look at climate change, it, I was thinking about ecological niches, keystone species. That's my science, that's my science brain. That's my Western worldview that I have, grown up with in this system. This is what the education system has taught me, a Western worldview. When I read the students' reflections, what I took away from it is really respect, reciprocity, and relationship. That's the Indigenous worldview. And so, you know, I really, um, if, you're, if you're interested in sort of this idea of ethical space, so Willie Ermine talks about the ethical space of engagement. 
And I have to say that that was, um, you know, it was like a light bulb came out for me because I was thinking like, we were trying to navigate as educators, Western worldview and indigenous worldview. And how do we do that in a respectful way? And I think that there, we have to sort of come to a resolution as a teacher that maybe every time that I go out with my students on the land, maybe pulling curricular expectations isn't the be all and end all of it. You know what, maybe the experience um, of what the students are going to take away in their own personal learning is very, very valuable. And, and to be honest, you know, I, I can't say that when I taught um, rates of chemical reaction in grade 10, and I said, you know, surface area increases it. I don't know if I went and found one of those students that I taught eight years ago, they may not remember at all. But you know what, that student that was breaking up the spruce and, and they got their hands, you know, they were, they changed color and they learned about how the, the hide was smoked. Maybe they're going to remember. So is either way of knowing better than the other? No, I, I don't think so. And so I think that that's sort of what draws me into this learning as a Anishinaabe Kwe um, and also as an educator. And, and so I just wanted to share that with everybody. Okay, next slide. I think that's um, I think that's everything for me, Marlo. We have oh, a we have a question. Yeah, um, I think it was. It might have just come up. Um, the question is, where can we get some of the knowledge of this reciprocity of, of human beings with the land, harvesting res responsibly, what the plants can teach us. And you know, there was an earlier question too around, and I'm gonna connect it to this question, like, is it okay for non-Indigenous people to smudge? And so I think we probably have a section of our audience tonight who like me and Larissa, you know, we're settlers here. We may or may not have relationships with the medicines and the land. Like, should we take steps in this direction? What, like, what are your thoughts on this, Marlo and Nancy? It's a big question. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay. Uh, so one thing that I want to share, um, and this is a teaching from Joe Petawanaquit. So, so I do want to say that I am, I am a baby in learning this knowledge. Okay, so um, I, I'm right alongside you. And so what he has shared with us is that we share with other people. That is part of who we are as Anishinaabe people. We are kind people and we are generous and, and walk in humility. And so he has said that, that it, when we share that knowledge, um, you know, that you are able to, to utilize that in a respectful way. Uh, to the question that somebody was asking about where can we learn about this, you know, I would direct you to, to my teacher. So I would direct you to engage in learning with Joe Petawanaquit. Um, you know, that's where, that's where I have learned so much. And so, like I said, with, way COVID is right now, he's easily accessible on Facebook, on the internet, you can watch some of his videos. And that idea of reciprocity, when you listen, and you keep listening, and you keep listening, you will, you'll take what you need from that, and, and you will be able to build that relationship as well. And so that's sort of how I feel on that. And I'll leave the smudging part uh, to Marlo. Miigwech. And so when we do our smudge, um, you know, sometimes there may even be Indigenous people that have never participated in that type of ceremony. And so uh, we, we look towards people with that knowledge to share practices. There is protocol. Um, there are times when women cannot smudge. Um, and so my advice would be to just reach out you don't know who's on that staff with you that may have a tie to um, Indigenous knowledge. Um, you may have that person that um, smudges at home before they come to school every day, and they may not share that with people. You have your Indian Friendship Centers. Most school boards now also have their uh, Indigenous leads within the school board that you can reach out to and ask for those types of teachings. Many of the school boards now are also moving towards having smudging policies in their school. And as Nancy said, we want to share this with you. We don't feel that it is uh, disrespectful for a non-Indigenous person to smudge. 
Um, we just ask that you be uh, given those teachings in a respectful way. Thank you for thank you for engaging with those questions. Um, I think if it's okay with you, do we have time for for maybe one more Marlo and Nancy? Because I see we're coming to our time. We don't want to keep you too long, but this has just been mind blown. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm just going to switch to this last quote and you go ahead and ask. Okay, switch to the quote. Did you want to talk a little bit about the quote or? No, no. You know what? It's just, I think both for Nancy and I, we really gravitate towards um, Marie Batiste. And she, she leaves, uh, I want to leave with this quote where she says, all First Nations and provincial schools require new teaching materials that depict accurately and adequately the culture, history, worldviews and philosophies of Aboriginal people, end quote. And so if I, I hope that Nancy and I were able to provide you with um, a, just a snapshot of, of how important our Indigenous um, uh, ways of knowing and teaching and providing that integrating community protocol in our elders and, and our knowledge keepers, we hope that we would, were able to inspire you this evening. So please, if there are questions, Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. One, yeah. yeah, thank you, um, Marlo and Nancy. Um, we're not quite done yet because the questions have just been uh, flowing in. Uh, there's one in particular that the audience is, is uh, asking. Many of the people watching tonight are from downtown Toronto, uh, where Angela and I are, are both <laughs> uh, from. And, you know, they're just commenting about what wonderful activities you have shared. Um, and, you know, they're kind of looking for a bit of advice about how, how do they do this in kind of an urban setting? And I know both of you have worked in, in urban settings before. Um, so can you just speak a little bit to, to an example or some advice on um, how to do this in, in kind of very urban settings? So uh, I, if you are looking to uh, study habitats or study um, a downtown Toronto, I will say the Humber River and all along there, if you can take your students down to the Humber, I was able to go there um, and participate in some really great uh, land activities and uh, through Dr. Jackman Childs. Uh, Dr. <laughs> that Jackman, long name. <laughs> Yeah, the, the real long one. <laughs> um, they really have some great connections with knowledge keepers and they are doing some fantastic um, salmon studies and um, the studies of natural habitat in that area, um, plant studies, um, and be careful for the little snakes because there's some around there. I saw them. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But another thing that I would like to mention is that in many of these areas, there are trappers associations. And these trapper associations have a great deal of knowledge. And I'm certain that if you reach out to them, they would probably be able to um, connect to local Indigenous uh, men and women because we both do uh, the act of trapping. And I think that that would probably be um, a great resource for you, the Trappers Association in your areas. Nancy, would you like to... Uh... Sure. I was just going to say, uh, we did uh, tanning hide in the schoolyard. Remember that? <laughs> so, you know, the, the key was for us was reaching out to Great Lakes Cultural Camps. They came with everything. And, and you know, what an amazing uh, family that they are. So my suggestion would be if you can reach out to organizations like that. The, the other thing is that in this time of COVID, you are able to connect um through video, right? And, and so, you know, just do whatever you can to connect commu to community in that way. And that if you're, if you're looking, um, you know, in an urban environment for um, medicinal, um, you know, barks and things like that, I, I will say that I have a sister in Ottawa, and, and she struggles with that sometimes too. But um, she has been able to maybe like sort of sneak some <laughs> you know like she has been able to and 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 what joe has taught us is that even in that urban environment 
um, you know, you might not think it's, it's um, you know, in a pristine area, but the medicinal properties of those plants are there. They're always there. They, they have been there for Anishinaabe people for thousands of years, and it will always be there. So my suggestion would be to do everything that you can, even in that urban environment, and reaching out uh, for support from Indigenous organizations and communities. Me go ahead. Um, Marlo and uh, Nancy, thank you so much again uh, for sharing your experience and your knowledge with us today. Uh, you opened up the presentation uh, with just like a beautiful invitation to learn, emphasizing that, you know, participants will and the audience will take away what they need to and, and just I just thought like what a beautiful invitation to sit, listen and, and, and take what you need um, from everything you've shared um, from, you know, tapping of the birch trees, the tamarack decoy making, the stewardship, the community learning, the reciprocity um, uh, and uh, being in connection to the land in, in a respectful way. And just a little bit from the audience, because I know you can't see, they've, um, I'll just read off some of the comments that they've made. You guys are amazing. These are our unbelievable experiences. All schools should have this type of teaching. I love this. Thank you all so very much. This is so incredible. I have such deep, deep respect for your work with students on the land and, and many more that have flowed in since then. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we're so lucky uh, to, to have you here tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Robertson team, the people you can't see behind the scenes, uh, Callan and Zach, our tech team, and then Julia, Alicia, Rebecca, and Hannah, who all helped uh, put this together um, from the registration to the promotion of all of it. Um, thank you very much to the team. Angela? Yeah, I, um, I'm just gonna echo that appreciation. And uh, both of you have taught so much tonight and I'll say that Nancy, when you mentioned the word visiting and how the learning was happening through that intergenerational visiting, um, it gave me a lot to think about and the different ways and settings that learning happening when we might not, I might not through the Western lens I've been educated in see it. So thank you. Um, you know, I really wanna thank the Robertson program for their partnership and really bring in the uh, Geek and New Amadawin webinar series to uh, the next level. Um, I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Um, we, from our end, are sponsored by uh, Shirk, and also we have a survey, which I'm going to put in the chat if you want to participate, which is part of Dr. Rastul's um, research. And, you know, with that all being said, you can check out these webinars. The last, this one and the last one was on the, uh, going to be on the Robertson Program's YouTube um, the other ones are, and this, these ones as well, will also be up on my website, angelanardozi.com slash webinars, all for free. And we hope you can join us in April. April's coming. It's just around the corner. We've got two wonderful guests, Erin Sperling and Amber Sandy. And I think that link is also going to be put uh, in the chat. And, you know, with that, I just want to say a big thank you. I get you Mingwich to uh, Marlo, Nancy, Larissa tonight. This is just I'm, I'm really gonna be chewing on this one for a while. So thanks everybody. Have a wonderful evening.